they've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. There it is, and it's not, it is not a pretty picture. But that is the condition that we entered this world in, all of us, and, um, and it is the condition that <clears throat> every person is in right now at this moment who is uh, outside of Christ, who doesn't, who doesn't know Christ. We're going to look at uh, um, specifically this morning, we're going to look at Paul's um, description of them. Uh, he says that they are alienated from the life of God and uh, <clears throat> due to a couple reasons. Your sound is not on, I don't think. My sound's not working? Your microphone? I mean, it's working, but it's echoey. It's echoey? Mm -hmm. Is that on? Yeah. Okay, no, that is what it is. All right, it is what it is. We thought we had a glitch there, so. Um, yes, and then so uh, they're alienated from the life of God because... And then he gives some reasons here. The ignorance that's in them, hardness of heart. And then the results of all of that there in verse 19. So, well, let's pray. And then with uh, MLJ's help, Lloyd-Jones, darkness and light. And this portion of his uh, series on Ephesians, Banner of Truth Trust Publishers, we'll uh, see if we can understand Paul's words here better. Father, we ask your blessing on us now as we open up your word again. We pray that by your spirit, you would open it up to us, that we would understand and <clears throat> particularly that we would uh, see more clearly the depths of sin and the hopeless <clears throat> condition that we were once in until in your mercy and kindness you um, turn on the lights in our minds that we might uh, come to faith in Christ and be born again. And so we pray, Father, that you would <clears throat> use our time in your word now to sanctify us further, strengthen our faith, make us more like Christ. And we pray this in in Christ's name, amen. All right, then. <clears throat> um, here we are, the condition of fallen man. Um, <clears throat> now, for one thing, as we look at this, we see what a dark condition the sinner is in, that man is in ever since the fall. And, uh, and it's vital that we understand just how hopeless the sinner's position uh, is, or we're going to go wrong in almost everything that we do in the church. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, if we have a superficial view of sin, all right, a shallow view of sin, we don't really get what the Apostle Paul is saying here about man and his sin, then we're going to have a superficial view of salvation. That is to say, eh, <clears throat> not that big of a deal. Now, people might not come out, professing Christians might not come out and actually say those words, ah, no big deal that God saved us or whatever. But nevertheless, in their thinking behavior, that is kind of, the thinking is betrayed in that sense to, to demonstrate that they're really not all that thankful for what God has done for us <clears throat> in Christ. You know, the standard view that we've looked at, more of an Arminian theology, is that uh, man contributes, at least he contributes faith to the equation, and then he still then has <clears throat> some ability. But if we don't understand the depths of man's sin, then our methods are also going to be wrong in what we do um, in the church. Listen to this quote by Lloyd-Jones here. 
We must have a true understanding of this pagan state and condition because it will, un, it will determine our method. If we realize the depth of iniquity, if we realize that this is nothing but the simple truth about everyone who is not a Christian, then I say <clears throat> it will drive us to our knees. It will help us to see that, <clears throat> that nothing short, and here's the point, nothing short of the mighty power of God's Holy Spirit can possibly deal with such a situation. And therefore, we will spend much more time in prayer. I don't hesitate to say that if you and I are not praying for revival, there's only one explanation. It's that we don't realize the nature of the problem confronting us. We think that we can still do it by means of organizations or other activities in the church. But once we see what man really is in his sin, we know that nothing short of the power of God can possibly deal with him, right? <clears throat> so there it is. Um, so what's going on in your typical local church today, right? Organizations, programs, <clears throat> methods, and, and so on. Um, based upon the assumption that either man has some ability in him uh, or that, and, and therefore that um, we can kind of package the gospel in such an attractive way. The Bible says it's a stumbling block and an offense to the natural man. But we can package it, package it in such a way, such an attractive way, that it will be attractive to the sinner, and he will choose Christ then uh, and be saved. And so that's why, you see, that's at the root of all the entertainment methods and so on that, are, that go on so typically um, in churches. We have to package the gospel in such a way that it will be um, <clears throat> pleasing, attractive, so that the sinner will want it, will want Christ. But that's entirely contrary to what the Bible says about the gospel, isn't it? Um, the Bible says that the unsaved man will regard Christians as fools. Um, Paul says that <clears throat> We are, we Christians are either a, a fragrance and aroma of life to those who are being saved, or we are the stench of death to those that are, that are perishing, all right? That, now, that's the reality of it. You can't put enough perfume on a rotting corpse to make it smell good for, for people, and yet... <clears throat> Really, that is, I think we have to face up to the fact that that is what um, so many pastors and local churches think that they can do. We'll just put enough perfume on this thing uh, and it, so that it'll smell good to people. And, it, you know, if you don't, if you don't do that, <clears throat> then the people aren't going to come and they won't choose... They won't choose Christ, you see. But I hope that you can see that they, man, it is impossible for man, the sinner, to choose Christ. He doesn't, he's deaf, he's blind to the gospel. The thing is impossible. It takes a recreation by God. It, it takes a, an act of God's mighty creative power so that he speaks let there be light and the lights come on that's what it takes and therefore the <clears throat> fundamental foundation of any uh, ministry of the church then has to be that people have to know uh, that we must we have to pray we have to ask god to e send his spirit and and bring life where there's nothing but nothing but death. Now, 
Paul says, as we mentioned earlier here in verse 18, that they are, the sinner is alienated, alienated from the life of God. He's a, as Paul says elsewhere, he's a stranger to the covenants of God, to this to the kingdom of God. He's, he's outside of it. He's a stranger. And the way Paul puts it here is being alienated from God. He's alienated from the life of God. Really, the sinner is a dead man walking, right? He, he's cut off <clears throat> from God. He's estranged from God and has been ever since the fall back in Eden. Uh, He's cut off from God because of his sin. Um, And when you're cut off from God, you're cut off from life. Let me show you back here in uh, John 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. Um, Let's see if we can find it here. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. He's talking about going to the cross, of course. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, now look at, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Here we see, by the way, in John 17 in this prayer, you see that there's no question Christ died specifically and effectually for his elect to all whom you have given me, right? That's who he's praying for here. Now, what I wanted to point out here is how do we talk about salvation? What are some of the terms we use? Well, one of the chief terms that we use is eternal life. When we're born again, we have, a, we have life, and it is eternal life, all right? <clears throat> that is the life that the sinner is cut off from. Verse, now, see, look at it in verse 3. And this is eternal life. What is this eternal life? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, What is it to have eternal life? What is this life? It's knowing God, knowing Him, being in vital relationship with Him, you see. But people that don't know God, who are alienated from Him, don't have that life, right? And that's so that's what. That's what Paul's talking about here in in Ephesians, that they are alienated. The sinner is alienated from from the life of God. Here's a few more good uh, quotes here. Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah, by the way, back in uh, chapter 2, right, where Paul gave us a reminder, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So, all right, <clears throat> to be alienated from God is to be alienated from life because life is in God. Uh, John chapter 1, John says that Christ, the Word that became flesh, was the, is the life and light of men, all right? So, <clears throat> without knowing God, without being in fellowship with God, is to be dead, because life is found in God. And Paul reminds us back here in chapter 2, and you, all of you Christians, you were dead. You were in that condition. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, all right? So there it is, and and that's just to keep us rather humble because that is the condition we were in then 
um, as well, alienated from from the life of God. Now, why is this? Paul says, because, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them. Ignorance. Um, Ignorant of what? Ignorant of what? Well, uh, this ignorance is being devoid of the knowledge of God. It's being ignorant of God. Now, people will typically, if pressed, unsaved people, if pressed, will will say, oh, I I believe in God. You know, I, I, I believe in God. But if you were to press them even more and say, well, tell me about this God that you believe in, uh, typically that'll be the end of the conversation. Why? Because they're ignorant of God. They're ignorant of God. Uh, There's people around, of course, that claim to be atheists and they don't believe in God, but that's a sham. Uh, But the fact of the matter is the person that doesn't know God is ignorant of God and everything about him, all right? So what are the truths that we know, that we know about, uh, about God? Well, everything about him, right? Um, <clears throat> by the way, I, want, I, I was going to make one other point in regard to being alienated from the life of God, all right? Just one I think, and this is an important point. Um, <clears throat> if a person is alienated from real life, true life, because that's what this eternal life is, that's what this li- the life of God is. It is, it is to really live because of being in fellowship with and, and because of knowing God, right? Knowing God. So the sinner who is alienated from God, from the life of God, who is ignorant of God, actually, as I said earlier, is a dead man walking. That is to say, he or she exists, but they don't really live. Not really. I mean, just think it through logically. If life is to be found in God, after all, he's the creator, right? There was nothing. There was no life until he said, let there be, and then there was. But that's where life comes from and and is to be found. And uh, uh, true life, real life. But if you are cut off from the fountainhead of, of that life, then you're not really living because you don't have life, right? You see, the, you see the logic of that. So what is true about the unsaved man is that he exists, but he doesn't really live, you see. He exists, but he doesn't really live. He's alienated from everything that this life of God um, is, you see. And so that's why uh, people uh, go, and you could probably identify this. If want, this is what you once were, were doing, right? And me too, is uh, <clears throat> spending their existence looking for meaning. I mean, ultimately, that's what the philosophers did and do, right? What are they looking for? They're looking for an explanation. They're looking for a meaning. But they, but they always come up empty because they don't turn to God, the, the living and true God then for it. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard that famous quotation of Augustine when he lived back in the 300s or something long ago. Um, his, his writings are still around, right? The, the confessions and, and so on. Uh, the city of God is another one. But uh, the, the quote that he's all, 
very famous for Augustine is, you have made us for yourself, the you being God, you, God, have made us, man, for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their, their rest in you. So that's what man is doing. He's always agitated, bouncing around, trying to find meaning, because that meaning is only to be found in God, but he's ignorant of God. And, and even more, he's, he's, hostile. he's hostile then uh, to God. And so he, he, here he is restless and busy, busy, busy in all kinds of ways, trying to find meaning in life. And I think Lloyd-Jones mentioned earlier in that connection, he said that it's so very often true that the unsaved man grows more and more cynical as he grows, as he grows older. Um, that is to say, you know, uh, vanity of vanities, as Ecclesiastes says. Everything is worthless, vanity. And it, uh, really, the honest sinner will, will be cynical. It's not a pretty picture. But if you have somebody say, well, yeah, but I know some older guy or gal, and they're not, they're not Christians, but, you know, they just seem to uh, have a very optimistic outlook. Well, that, well that's a lie. <laughs> it's a false optimism, all right? You know, oh, ev- everything's just wonderful, and so well, it's not wonderful. But the person who is truthful will have to say, being alienated from God, not knowing God, not being born again, is to say, well, what's it all worth? Well, nothing then, you see. So, uh, um, so, well, let's move on here. Paul says that a couple of reasons that man is alienated from the life of God. First one is ignorance, all right? And as we said, ignorant of what? He's ignorant of God. Um, that's the fundamental thing that he's lacking. He may be extremely intelligent. He may excel in, in scientific knowledge or mathematical knowledge or all kinds of hands-on skills and art and so forth. <clears throat> but when it comes to the knowledge that is really vital, that where, where life is really to be found, he didn't know anything about that. He is ignorant of it because he's alienated then from God, who is the fountainhead and source of that life. So the sinner goes through his existence uh, being ignorant of God. He's ignorant of the glory of God, for example. Remember, Isaiah goes into the the temple and he sees the Lord lofty and exalted and his train of his robe filling the temple. And Isaiah's Isaiah's response to this glorious God is um, that he is holy, holy, holy. and, uh, and, And Isaiah pronounces woe upon himself. Woe is him because he's a sinner, he's a man of unclean lips. And, but there he has this vision of, of the glory of God. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to even pin down a, the definition of glory. I think at the root of it is kind of this blinding light. And uh, the, the, the heavens declare the glory of God. But man never gets above the heavens, that is, the stars and the sky. He looks at the stars and attributes a kind of glory to them, but he doesn't get beyond it to the real glory, which is the glory of God. The stars are declaring, the psalmist says, the the glory of God. But the sinner, he doesn't see it. He He turns to astrology and makes the stars be the, the gods and, and so on. He's ignorant then 
of the glory of God. And he's ignorant of all of the attributes of God. He's ignorant of God's, of God's holiness and, and, his, and his majesty. He's ignorant of God's justice and, and righteousness. In fact, so often when <clears throat> the sinner sees God's justice, for instance, against wickedness, against sin, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't like it. He's ignorant of God's power. He's ignorant of the fact that God, right at this moment, that he's not only the creator, but he's the sustainer of the universe. He's sustaining, he's holding it together. You can read about that in Colossians 1, where Paul says that Christ is holding the universe together. It's through Christ that all things were created. And that means that all of the forces in nature, like gravity, magnetism, and on and on we could go, um, that's God. That's the ultimate explanation. But man's ignorant of that. So that he could be a brilliant scientist, but in the end, he, there's, a, there's a stopping point. There's a point at which he can't explain things because the only explanation is God. The mere fact that there's life in this world, let's say, well, let's say, you could say animal life too, or plant life, but let's say human life. Why does man exist? Why is man why is why is there life? How do you explain that? Well, what man does in his ignorance is he creates all kinds of alternate explanations, right? Evolution and so on, which is stupid. It, it's stupid. Why? Because in the end, when you get right down to it, evolution is nothing more than saying that something came out of nothing. At one time, there was nothing. Now there is something, something. And, uh, and some of the things are alive. There's life, you see. So <clears throat> a fish didn't just grow legs and walk out of the ocean onto the, and become a man, right? You, you see that. I mean, why does man come up with such stupid ideas like that? It's because he's ignorant He's ignorant of, of God. Um, <clears throat> he's ignorant of God's purpose. And so <clears throat> he doesn't have real purpose in his own life. <clears throat> what do we mean by God's purpose? Well, why did God create the heavens and earth? Why did God create man? He, he created man so that the chief end, the chief purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But the sinner can't enjoy God and he can't <clears throat> glorify God because, because he doesn't know God. He's, he's ignorant then of God. And so <clears throat> ultimately, and this explains an honest sinner's cynicism, right? His pessimism is due to the fact that if he's honest with himself, there is no purpose. What's the point of it all? There is no purpose. If you take God out of the equation, which the sinner does because he's ignorant of God, then you've, you've taken purpose out of life purpose out of the existence of this globe that we live on, the earth, <clears throat> the, the purpose of the universe. You know, what's the purpose of it all? What's the point of it all? Well, there isn't any. And so the philosopher goes out and blows his brains out, right? Um, but in Christ, when we know God, his revelation of his word opens up to us and we we see 
He's had a purpose from, e from eternity past, a glorious purpose. His, his purpose in, he had a purpose in creating man, that we might enjoy him and know him and have eternal life and glorify him. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of Eden, of why God said, let there be light, right? Why he separated the oceans and the, and the dry land and why he said, let there be vegetation and fish swarming in the seas and all of these things. And then he created man and breathed into man the breath of life and, and created from the man woman and all of those things. He has a purpose in it, a purpose, so that man could enjoy him. He's done that all for us, that we might be his people, be in fellowship with him, know him, glorify him. But, it, but if you remove God from the picture, you're left with purposelessness. And that's where the sinner lives. If you were to ask him or her, what's the purpose of your life? What's the point of your life? Well, they'd be kind of hard pressed to uh, come, up, come up with an answer. So if you think about it, what is the purpose of just existing? Having known, being alienated from God, right? Being ignorant of God. Um, you don't understand. You, you can't connect the dots. Uh, you can't start at Genesis and go right on through Scripture to Revelation and see God's wonderful redemptive plan in Christ. <clears throat> you don't see it, and you don't, and you don't get it. And you don't, and there's something else you don't understand if you remove God from, from the equation. If you don't know God. And that is that history, um, the drama being played out on, in human history, not only had a beginning point, it has an end point. There's an alpha and there's an omega. There's an omega point, an end point. Things are not going to go along as they are right now forever and ever and ever. Uh -uh, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is there is a day on which, appointed by God, God is going to judge the world in righteousness, as Paul said in Acts 17, right? Uh, he's going to judge the world in righteousness through a man who is he, whom he has appointed. And he's furnished proof to everybody that this is the man through whom I'm going to judge all of you, the man Christ Jesus. And he furnished proof by raising him then uh, from the dead, you see. And then comes the new heavens and the new earth and eternal life and where everything is right, where righteousness dwells, right? So, um, but you see, the sinner, he's cut off from all. He has, he has no sense of that, no understanding of that because... He doesn't know God. What is more pathetic than this scenario? Day after day after day, month after month after month, year after year after year, century after century after century. It just goes on and on and on. Or if you want to get into some kind of what, Eastern mysticism or something, well, there's a perpetual cycle. There's an end point to the present cycle, but then another cycle just begins. And here we go again, and here we go again, you see. Purposeless says, what's the point? The thing just goes on for, uh, forever and ever. But that's not the biblical explanation of history. There is an end point. There is a day of, of judgment. There is a day coming when Christ comes again and this present world is going up in smoke, all right? It's going to be, 
and the new heavens and the new earth are going to be brought in. Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire, done, gone, and all who followed him, all who rejected Christ, they will be gone. The wicked will be gone. We'll never ever see them again. That'll be it. And so it's only in Christ and only in knowing God that you can make any sense out of anything. Any sense out of anything. Somebody says, uh, well, now, you know, I don't go in for this religious stuff, but my dad always said the point of life is to be responsible, to, to, work, to work hard, to be a good patriotic citizen in your community. All right, fine. Those things might be noble and, and so on. <clears throat> but let's talk about ultimate things. Ultimately, your life is going to end. You may have been the most responsible, kind person, all these kinds of things, but, but your life is going to end. That's it. You see, then what? Because real meaning, real life is eternal. It necessarily, it necessarily has to be eternal, or what's the point? What is, what is the point? Well, there must have been some point. Look at how, yeah, but your life ends, and if that's it, then then what? What is the point? You see, it's only, it's only eternal things that are real. Let's put it that way. There, it's only eternal things, eternal life, um, an eternal heavens and earth that will never end, right? Um, only eternal things that are real. Everything else is, I think that's kind of what maybe C.S. Lewis called shadows, right? We live in the land of shadows in this present world. It's a vapor. Life is a, is a vapor. But for something to have true substance and true existence, it has to be eternal. It has to be, it has to be forever. Well, <clears throat> and as Lloyd-Jones notes at the end of this particular chapter, he says, our hearts ought to bleed for all people who are not Christians. Um, why? Well, they're, they've missed it. They're missing it. They're, they don't realize that real meaning and real life comes in knowing God, and that and to know Him requires knowing His Son, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they do not know it, he says, because of the ignorance that's in them. They don't know that they can become children of God and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It can all be theirs if they will but uh, turn to Christ. He ends this chapter with, uh, this is a hymn. I don't know that we've ever sung this. I'm not sure that it's even in our hymn book. It was written by W.T. Matson. Uh, Lord, I was blind, I could not see. In thy marred visage, that means appearance, any grace. But now the beauty of your face in radiant vision dawns on me. Lord, I was deaf. And the hymn's going to go through, I was blind, I was deaf, I was dumb, couldn't speak. I was dead, you see. Lord, I was deaf. I could not hear the thrilling music of your voice, but now I hear you and rejoice and all your uttered words are dear. Lord, I was dumb. I could not speak the grace and glory of your name, but now, as touched with living flame, my lips your eager praises wake. Lord, I was dead. I could not stir my lifeless soul to come to you. 
But now, since you have quickened me, I rise from sin's dark sepulcher. And finally, Lord, you have made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, the dead to live, and lo, I break the chains of my captivity. I'll have to see if we can find that hymn. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if he ever really gave the title of it there, but uh, anyway. Well, I think, how are we doing on time, Verla? Nine minutes. Nine minutes, all right. Well, I think, we'll, but I think we'll stop right there because we're going to go on and talk about um, <clears throat> this business of the hardness of heart. You kind of see how this progresses here. In verse 18, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because, here's the reasons, because of the ignorance that's in them and because the heart, it's on their heart. That's not quite right. It progresses this way. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to, all right, this ignorance of God is, of man, about God, right, is due to man's hardness of heart. Hardness of heart. And we want to look at that. Man's heart, the seat of his affections, and emotion, is fallen. He should love God and warmly praise God, but he doesn't. He's He's got a hard heart. And then verse 19 will go on, hands-on practical results of all of this. You become callous, like a, a callous on your hand. You can't feel because it's so thick. And have given themselves up to sensuality. Like his conscience is dead. He's dead to God. And he's greedy to practice every kind of, of impurity. That's the ugly ugly condition then of man in his sin and we'll look at that further next time father we thank you for your word thank you that you've delivered us in christ out of this ugly pit that pit of hopelessness and meaninglessness which is the inevitable result of existing apart from you we thank you, Father, that you opened our eyes, opened our ears. You gave us hearts to love you. You gave us new hearts. You caused us to be born again. And we give you thanks and glory for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.